Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with SAG After Foundation and I'm so thrilled that you're joining us to watch another one of our conversations at home. Um, we're really delighted today to be joined by Morgan Spector who's currently appearing at HBO's The Plot Against America and we have Maya Singer here to interview him um, who is a writer and journalist and also a friend of his. So we're super thrilled that you're joining us and watching this and I will hand it over to you Maya. Thanks so much. Thank you so much Mara. Um, so Morgan, I mean, I guess my first question for you is, um, at this particularly, um, kind of relaxing time in the world, um, how does it feel to be, uh, the star of, um, an incredibly relaxing show, The Plot Against America? Yeah, well, uh, it's all, it's all very chill. <laughs> um, and I think anybody that's familiar with David Simon's work, uh, you know, his work is synonymous with chill. It's the kind of stuff you turn on while you're doing laundry or making grilled cheese sandwich. Uh, and you don't really have to pay that much attention. It doesn't demand much of you. Um, and I think, you know, that's the kind of TV that we need now um, in, these, in these trying times. No, um, you know, I think, you know, I find myself wanting both things, right? Like I want, you know, uh, well, I don't know, whatever just to sort of break the fourth wall. Maya is Zoom calling me uh, <laughs> from my attic uh, so that we can both uh, be on computers and not get on each other's microphones, but we're quarantining together. Uh, and, you know, I think I'm sure you would agree that, like, our consumption, our TV consumption habits right now have reflected both a desire for pure escapism and also for something substantive that speaks to the moment that we're in. Um, and allows us to process some of what's some of what's going on in our heads um, in a way that's maybe not quite so I don't know dread inducing as actually just immersing ourselves in the news mm -hmm. uh, so yeah I mean I hope that you know the, the way I you know I, I th this show I was really I was really con thinking oh it's really fascinating that this consider this sort of you know the it can't happen here. Sinclair Lewis novel sort of follows the depression as this miniseries follows the 2008 recession. Mm -hmm. But now I'm, it's sort of like, well, we could be entering maybe the greatest depression, maybe the, the biggest, most tremendous depression ever. <laughs> uh, so, you know, our show could be sort of newly relevant in a horrifying way. I mean, like, right. As, as Trump would put it, probably like the greatest, most fantastic depression. A beautiful depression, most, a truly, yeah. truly beautiful depression. <laughs> it's a, folks, folks. Uh, no, I mean, uh, again, you know, we have been quarantined together and we've also been watching Plot Against America together. And at mm -hmm. the conclusion of every single episode that's aired thus far, I say, well, that was incredibly upsetting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it only, I, I haven't seen, I've, I've held off on the next half, but I do think it only gets more upsetting from here on out. Oh, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think, but, you know, it is a, like, I, actually, let's dial back. I feel like, I feel like we've kind of advanced this conversation um, to uh, a little too far. And let's just roll back to, uh, you were already like a big Philip Roth fan and had read this book, I think around the time it came out. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, when you heard that um, <laughs> master of chillfotainment, David Simon, <laughs> <laughs> wanted you to audition um, to play the part of Herman in this show. I mean, like, you know, I guess I'm just curious, like, what were your initial, what your initial reactions were, aside from just thinking it would be, like, a cool project, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it had been a minute since I read it. And so, yeah, I mean, I had that reaction of, holy shit, Phil Broth, holy shit, David Simon, like, uh, you know, holy shit, I get to be in this thing. And that was the sort of, I think, an overriding experience of it. In the, if, but until I reread the novel. Um, yeah, because, you know, I'm a Roth fan that likes the, the like, you know, the, the sexual obsessiveness and the, you know, the kind of the, the, the layers of, like, sort of meta narrative that Roth deploys over and over again. Um, and so I love like Sabbath's theater and the counter life and the sort of like darker, weirder books. And this was not one of those, you know, like there's, there's, there's a little come in this book, but like not very much. Um, and, uh, 
so yeah, when I initially read it, I was like, this is good. You know, this is a sturdy book. Uh, and I liked it. I enjoyed it, but I wasn't sort of, uh, rattled by it or roused by it in a way that I often am by his books. And then, yeah, when I went back and read it again, having been cast in this and read it in light of, you know, in light of the aftermath of the 2008 recession, in light of our, our current, uh, political moment where some of the foundational, assumptions about American democracy, about American politics writ large, about the way our whole economy functions, when a lot of these, a lot of, a lot of those foundational assumptions have been called into question. Um, and I think that's true, actually, whichever side of the political aisle you're on. I mean, I think, like, there's an obvious parallel here, you know, between Lindbergh and Trump, and between, particularly between, you know, the idea of America first and the rise of the movements around these people. But I also think, you know, Everybody is looking around thinking, is America still working for me? I don't think that's, I don't think that's just a, a left or liberal uh, idea. Um, you know, so. it's, like, it's what's interesting to me is like watching the show is of all the characters, your character actually strikes me as being the most, the most recognizable in terms mm. of the kind of modern pantheon of post 2016 characters mm -hmm. and, and you know it's like you can see Herman listening to Walter Winchell feels so exactly like you know my parents uh watching MSNBC exactly at, like you know and like watching Rachel Maddow in the run-up to like you know the impeachment or whatever and just being like this is it you know they got him now and yeah. you know just the sheer disbelief um at like the fact that the, 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 the norms are breaking and the system isn't holding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I just really was curious whether, you know, coming to that character, that was something that you, like, was that something that you were really like bringing to the character or was that something that was in the book? Was that something that was in the scripts? Like where, where was the process there, you know? I mean, I think the answer sort of all of the above. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, this, in the novel, Winchell is an enormous figure, I think for every, all of the Jews of Wequay, that we, you know, he, he is this kind of, you know, he is their avatar in the public sphere at the, in this moment, um, you know, sort of defending their honor and, you know, fighting evil and, you know, he ultimately becomes the sort of, you know, great hope for them. But, um, but I think that's amplified in our, in our series, I think deliberately by David and Ed to, David Simon and Ed Burns to try to, I think, I think draw that parallel, you know what I mean? That, that sort of, uh, and sh show the sort of 1940s version of, you know, the, polit the, the sort of political junkie, like the, you know, the, the news obsessed um, politics freak. But I also, you know, like, I was living through this moment and read this, reading these scripts again. I was like, well, this is, you know, it's not, it's not the same mass cultural thing, mm -hmm. but like I'm listening to Chapo all the time and like, you know, getting all of this catharsis from that and also, or, or, or being, you know, being roused to political action. I mean, I would, I would like, we went and canvassed all through this primary, but, you know, that's partly because of them. And like in the same way, you know, Winchell, in this story has, uh, you know, starts to have real world power in addition to that kind of like Maddo uh, kind of fictional comic book superhero friend power. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it feels, I definitely feel like Herman is a recognizable type in, in exactly that way. But I think, and I, and I you know, I, I think like, you know, kind of unless you're actually out in, it, like, unless you're actually someone who's like Alvin in this story, unless you decide to go kill the Nazis, unless you decide to go throw yourself in the gears in some way and try to stop the machine, like, we're all Herman. Herman. You know, it may be hard to admit, but all of us are kind of taking in this information, having these misgivings, having this sort of question of where this is all going, and not necessarily stopping our lives, you know, not necessarily like bringing everything to a crashing halt and heading off to join the barricade, so... Yeah, I, I agree. I think he's a, he's a kind of, there's something, there's something of a, he's like a character out of a modern parable in some way. Yeah, I mean, I think like the other thing that um, has struck me watching the show is, you know, as much as we talk about 
the the sort of modern phenomenon of like the filter bubble and like the you know the algorithm just like drives us to kind of only take in the things that are relevant to ourselves and so therefore we really find the outer world and other people's points of views pretty much like incomprehensible you know watching the show and seeing like you know the the world of plot against america this this new jersey village kind of jewish world which i know about by proxy because that is very similar to like the world that you know my grandmother grew up in in the jewish part of detroit and just realizing like well that was its own kind of filter bubble too you know it's like when everybody that you you know when everybody that you know everybody in your community is all sort of like feeling some version of the same thing about what's happening in the world like you know in the last episode that aired was the one where we, um the levens travel to washington dc and that feeling of like breaking the filter bubble was very strong mm. and that suddenly there's like a new sense of, of the reality on the ground um so anyway, just uh, that's more commentary than, than question. But again, just kind of goes to the, the history doesn't, you know, repeat, but it does rhyme of it all. Yeah, the Levins are all those reporters after the 2016 election, like going to flyover country. And they, how do the deplorables live? Kind of, yeah. I see the echo and- <laughs> um, I, you know, speaking of like the Levens as a family, I mean, I think that the other thing I wanted to, I've been wanting to ask you about, you know, like when I'm, when I'm not just playing the part of your friend in mm-hmm. your house, um, you know, as a prof- matter of professional curiosity, I'm just really, really curious, like working with Zoe Kazan and with, um, like the kids who play like your children, I mean, you really, uh, it's just incredible the way that you actually like conjure familiness in this mm-hmm. show um, in a way that I can only think of like maybe a few other places I've seen that on television, that sense of just a really lived in kind of family dynamic and the extended family too, with like Alvin and Winona. And, um, you know, and I just, I guess I'm wondering like, again, you know, where did that start for you in terms of building that? Yeah. I mean, I think it starts, I mean, first of all, thank you. That's, that's it's really nice to hear. I, you know, that was something we definitely actively pursued as a company, like our little ensemble, we were really trying to create that. I mean, I think it's a certain way, it has to start with the writing. I mean, Roth, you know, the, these characters are so specific because he took so much from this real, from his family. And I'm sure he altered these characters and, you know, in, in the way that every writer does, but there's a specificity there that, um, maybe you don't get unless you're writing about your real family uh, and digging down into the perspective of your eight-year-old self to remember how you saw them then. Um, but so it starts there, I think it starts with the novel and then it starts with, you know, David and Ed overlaying their own families. Cause I know, you know, there, I think David Simon saw a lot of echoes of his family in this family and brought, brought that into the, into the, into the writing as well. Um, and then I don't know, maybe, you know, both that we, you know, this was Zoe's first job back after having a child. Um, it was definitely, it's not my first job, but it was my, um, it was my first job with a, where having children was a really big part of the character, um, since actually having a daughter. Uh, and so I don't know, I think, you know, both Zoe and I were very, like, uh, very collaborative on this from the beginning, uh, in dialogue a lot, like, sent, you know, sort of emailing back and forth a lot, um, sort of talking, like, digesting the scripts together as they came in, um, and, you know, working to, just working to build that, um, you know, part of the way this script, these scripts work, I think, is that, you know, you'll, at just at the moment that you're starting to think, man, this Herman Levin guy, like he's got to, he's got to start to see what's really going on around him. You shift perspective and you see that best does see that. Mm-hmm. And so you never doubt that the story, the, sto- the, the, the show itself has a perspective on Herman that is maybe not Herman's own perspective. Um, and I think that that is a really, it allows, 
I don't know, it allows us to tell the story of his family in a way that I think is, uh, is really rich um, and, very, and lets these characters be really uh, sort of three-dimensional and well-rounded. So that was something Zoe and I really pursued. And also, just in the case of the kids, like, we just got really lucky. Like, they're both just great. I mean, uh, you know, Eji already has, like, like, a better career than any of us. Like, <laughs> Caleb is, I mean, I don't know that, I, I feel like I haven't talked about this enough, or, or, but um, this is basically Caleb, who plays Sandy, is basically his first job. Wow. And, you know, he came in, uh, I think he was cast two days before the reading, the read-through. We read three episodes in a single day. And he came in, and it's, you know, it's it's a fairly stacked room. It's John Turturro and Ron Ryder and David Simon, and all, you know, all these HBO execs. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just came in and did a beautiful first read. And he was clearly terrified, but he, you know, sort of bore up under, despite that. Um, and he was just... I don't know, incredibly, like incredibly professional and uh, focused and, but also playful and, you know, a joy to be around. I know both of the kids were uh, just like truly extraordinary lucky finds. I mean, that's also Alexa Fogel who uh, cast this and cast The Wire. And if you think about the young cast of The Wire, you know, Michael B. Jordan was one of the, you know, one of the sort of early finds of that series. Um, and there, there are a couple more, there's a couple more people who were on, you know, who were like eight or nine or 10 year old kids on that show who went on to be a uh, big deal. So anyway, yeah. Um, you know, since we've only had the first three episodes aired, um, I'm kind of limiting to those three episodes. Very sensibly, thank you. Um, <laughs> but I'm just wondering of those, you know, within those three episodes, is there a particular scene that for you was like, as an actor, you know, just the most, the most challenging, you know, mm-hmm. where it's like, or, or alternatively, like not the most challenging to get into, but maybe the most challenging to actually walk away from. Hmm. Um, I mean, there are a couple, there's, I don't know if I've told you already about how, cha- how like what a kerfuffle it is to shoot in the Lincoln Memorial, but just on a sheer technical level, it's basically impossible. They make it so you, they won't let you record sound and you can only have five people uh, from your cast and crew in the Memorial at, at one time, like in the actual temple part of the Memorial where we were shooting, mm-hmm. um, which means, which includes your camera, your sound, your light, uh, you can't, and then your ca- cast, and it was a scene with uh, five actors. Mm-hmm. So we had to shoot it with sometimes one half of the cast and sometimes the other half of the cast, uh, pretending that we were all there all the time. Uh, it was a real, it was a real mess. So that was, I mean, that was a challenge. I mean, it was amazing to be in that uh, memorial and sort of reading the Gettysburg Address actually in the context of this show, uh, which is just honestly one of the most beautiful pieces of writing ever. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a perfect text. Um, but it also, it, I don't know, it captures like the, the genius of American democracy and the sense of its promise. And you're, you're just standing in there doing this piece where that, that genius, that promise has been so utterly betrayed um, and then confronting this, the extent to which that is being echoed in our contemporary politics, that was very haunting, actually, I found. Um, it was hard not to be, hard not to be sort of moved and awed and uh, unsettled by that. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe that one. I don't know, but as, I, as I've talked about it, I sort of started thinking, oh, that was the technically challenging one. But no, it was actually, I think maybe both. Um, there's that sense of, as you're saying, you leave your bubble and you realize, oh, actually, like, I'm not safe outside my bubble. <laughs> you know, we're, not, we're not safe. We, have to, we should have stayed. We need to stay in our bubble. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, the, you know, the next question is, do you have the, do you, can you, do you have the power to do that? Or is your, your bubble... Uh, gonna be burst man <laughs> <laughs> i mean right now i feel like our bubbles are very very small 
yeah. um, right. because of, you know, COVID-19. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I bring that up actually as somebody who like, I mean, you know, I know you really well and I also know that you're a person who has quite serious political commitments, you know, out, like different from the political commitments of the show or the character mm-hmm. that you play on the show. And, you know, I guess like, I mean, are you, where do you see like, I mean, this is a big question, like at this, at this dark time, I mean, like, what do you feel like it's so easy to be insular right now? And like, mm-hmm. how do you see the, the path towards, I don't know, like moving forward as like a society from this incredibly strange thing that's happening to us, like, which we, we're going to need to do together. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I was, you know, we, we, we have arrived at this COVID-19 moment um, sort of after a presidential primary that I found kind of shocking, actually, like the, the way that it turned, not, I would not kind of shock, it was incredibly shocking to me, the way that that primary turned. And I think were we not in the middle of a global pandemic, we'd be talking a lot more about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I had a lot of, there were things that I felt like I knew about what was going on, what was afoot in American politics. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually I, obviously the ground has shifted enormously, but the results of that, the results so far of the primary have also kind of undermined a lot of my certainties um, because it's a very strange situation that we're in where in state after state, you had people saying, I want Medicare for all. I want free public college. I want debt forgiveness. I want all these things, but I am still going to vote for the other guy who's not going to even try to do those things. You know, I want a green new deal, but you know, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to go the other way. Uh, and I think, you know, there are probably a lot of reasons for that. You know, there's, it, it's, I think it's hard, you know, I, obviously I was a Sanders supporter and I think there are a lot of, you know, there's, there's probably, you know, blame to be laid at the feet of laid at the feet of the Sanders campaign in terms of not doing enough outreach to, you know, like MSNBC voters who have been, steeping in anti-Trump rhetoric for four years and think that there is nothing more important than uh, ending his presidency um, and don't feel like we have room for, you know, these other big, big projects. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know, given, given that we were in that moment of political confusion already, now that this other crisis has come upon us, it's hard to know. I mean, I, I, it's hard to know where we go from here. You know, I think in some ways, like to be really grim about it, I think it depends on the body count. Like, you know, if, if enough people die from this in this country, and then I think it rattles the, I mean, obviously the economic impact of this is going to be enormous, is enormous, is going to continue to be enormous, is going to change this country. Uh, but I think in terms of its political impact, you know, I mean, I don't know, I, you remember, you know, Hurricane Katrina was was George W. Bush's turning point as a president. You know, right. He got reelected despite the Iraq war, you know, the left screaming about it forever uh, and being ignored. And then Hurricane Katrina happened. He mismanaged it horribly. And something about his presidency and the way he operated was laid bare. And, you know, we, I, I keep waiting. We keep waiting. Uh, for Donald Trump's Katrina moment. Um, and this, you sort of look at how he's handled this and he has absolutely contributed to the needless death of hundreds of, of tens of thousands of people. Uh, and somehow his approval rating is still, you know, sky high. So, you know, that has to shift otherwise. And I don't know what's, I, otherwise we, you know, we really have no hope of, um, of turning this crisis into something that actually like changes, changes this country for the better. Uh, and I don't know if that'll happen. 
I feel like I've asked you like a terribly unfair question, given the fact that I myself am like measuring the future in increments of like three days. I'm like, as are we all? I mean, what like, the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, like, you know, we'll what are we going to do when you come downstairs? Like, I don't know. Yeah, no. I mean, it's like, are we are we still allowed to like go to the grocery store? Let's find out in three days. I think we're supposed to wear masks now. Today. Yeah. I think today we should be wearing masks. Um, yeah. So I guess like I'll probably the last question I'll ask you is um, how are you planning to um, adapt yourself as an actor to our mask wearing future? Um, I feel like this is going to be an interesting challenge for people whose professions have relied primarily on their expressive faces. Mm -hmm. So um, I know you have like a big project lined up. Um, which is, of course, like everything else on, on hold um, mm -hmm. for at least like a couple of months. But um, yeah, I mean, our <laughs> like, I mean, I, as a serious question, though, like, how do you kind of stay like, how are you staying tuned up as an actor right now? You know, knowing that like at some moment there's going to you're going to get a phone call that like your thing is ready to go again in like X number of weeks and you have to be your must like you can't just let like, your muscles atrophy. I mean, honestly, I'm, I I would say that I'm not doing a good job of that. Like right <laughs> now, I am. I mean, fortunately, I have a two year old daughter who is like lives in an imaginary world, and you know, she demands that I play about ten different characters a day in a kind of like one to two minute rotation. <laughs> so I mean, that to some extent, that's keeping me on my toes. But uh, but yeah, I mean. I don't know, like I, I keep finding myself, I keep thinking like, oh, I should be doing some work or immersing myself in something. And, you know, this is a great opportunity to like really get ready for this thing. And uh, I'm struggling to do it. I'm struggling to focus on on something that, you know, it, it's like you said, it's it's on pause sort of, I don't know when we're going to go back to work. Uh, I'm, I think I'm definitely someone who needs a deadline. Yeah. Um, but I mean, on the other hand, Morgan, you have been, you have been making some excellent meals. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, no, and that's and that's that's very that's very creative. And you know, we do our. You know, I also have the I have the uh, I have the great uh, privilege of living right now with two writers, and so you know, part of what we do is you know get drunk and you know make up make up movies and shows. And I think that kind of is this the know, appropriate is this the appropriate ways. forum for us to like pitch things. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Should we just pitch yeah. some of our like better ideas here live on Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> um, some of those like eleven o'clock at night, couple of you know scotches down. Sure, what have you got? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Baggage, the biopic about the person who invented the wheeled suitcase. <laughs> I think it's a strong pitch. We do have to get that guy's life rights, though. I don't think there's a way around it. Yeah, I'll, no. I'll plot. Yeah, yeah. No yeah. relation to Sylvia, I don't think. Uh, but wouldn't it be funny if there was? What was it called? Carry on? Keep keep calm and carry on? Or no, just call it baggage. <laughs> right, or just baggage. Uh, I think this is over. I think we've done it. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll see you downstairs. See you in a minute. Thanks. In a minute. Thank you, Morgan.